have your Bibles today, and I hope you do. Yeah, take those out. I'll meet you in the Gospel of John, chapter 15. The Gospel of John, chapter 15. We continue in our series of messages through the letter of 1 John, but today I'm taking a detour. And I'll explain that more in a bit. But the title of this series is that you may know in 1 John, there are things that he wants us to know. And so I have made it a routine in this series to check and see what you know uh, with some Bible trivia at the beginning of each week. And so let's jump right into those and see what you know. Number one. On what day did God create man? I, I hear a bunch of S's, so I assume you're saying sixth. Uh, on the sixth day, uh, God created man. Number two, how many people were on board Noah's Ark? I've heard six and I've heard eight. If you said eight, you are correct. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. Uh, Genesis chapter 7 is the answer to that one. Uh, number three, what city mentioned in the book of Revelation is also the name of a city in the United States of America? Philadelphia. You guys are on it today. I made these too easy. All right. Let's see how you do with your bonus question this week. Just, did I hear somebody say, oh, no? <laughs> How do we know Peter was a rich fisherman? I didn't hear any answers on that one. Well, we know it by his net income. <laughs> move, move along, move along, all right. Hey, today I'm taking a detour. I hope, I hope you'll be okay with that. I have to admit that for the past couple of weeks, I've been on a spiritual journey that I did not anticipate uh, coming into this series. For the past couple of weeks, I have stood in front of you and pressed onto you fairly sternly the issue of abiding. We just sang about it in this last song. David, I don't know how you chose that to be right before the sermon, but it was perfectly timed. As I've stood in front of you and talked about the importance of abiding in Christ, I've gone home and asked myself, Joel, are you abiding? And so I started a journey. I tried to, for, for the past couple of weeks, I've tried to note take personal inventory of how often I'm abiding in Christ during a day, normal day, normal work day, emails, meetings, lunches with people, uh, whatever. How often during the day am I aware of the presence of Christ? And I came to the conclusion that I was not practicing what I was preaching. Now, let me say this. I, I'm not out doing bad stuff. I'm, I, I'm doing normal days just like you are. I'm not out cussing and drinking and smoking and this and that and whatever else. I'm just going through my day, and, and I'm standing up here saying, we need to abide, man. We've got to abide in Christ. And then I look at myself and say, there are gaps, Joel, in your day when it's not even a thought on your mind. The presence of Christ. Now, we all know that he's with us. We often pray for people, Lord, will you be with them? I'm not sure that's a necessary prayer because the Bible teaches us that he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He's always with us. But are we aware of it? And as I looked at my life, I have been on this sweet journey for the past two weeks of making it a point throughout my day to be aware of the sweet presence of Christ. And it has been 
Uh, I'll call it a, a, a revival, a refreshment of my soul. I, I'm like you. I have that time set aside in the morning when I get up and I open the word and I read and I pray and, and I study and I look at this. So even that time has become sweeter and richer. It's not just a routine of life, but an actual Lord, I am aware of your presence and I'm thankful to be sitting here with you. Driving in the car might be the most difficult time during your day to abide in Christ. (laughs) Can I get an amen on that one? So today I'm, I'm taking a detour and... I want to take us to another passage that John penned uh, that focuses in on this issue of abiding. I hope you know me well enough by now that though I've been pressing into this issue of abiding in Christ, it is not my intent or goal for you to feel guilty about how much you're abiding. Guilt is a pretty poor motivator. It is my intent, it is my goal that wherever you are in your walk with Christ, that today you would pick up where you are and begin making it a point throughout your day to abide. That it just becomes something that, like breathing, like eating, it's just, I'm aware of it. I'm aware of my need for his presence throughout the day. You might be thinking, Joel, isn't that we pay you to do? Joel, isn't that what you're supposed to be doing? Isn't the hallway in the church offices just angels singing all day long? Oh, I thought, I thought that's all. No, I, I'm a man just like you're a man. I'm a person just like you're a person, and I have distractions in my life just like you do. And this word in our text last week out of 1 John The practice of righteousness, the practice of sinning, it's this practice, that word that I want you and I to really grab a hold of. Practicing the presence of Christ in our life. To practice it. There have been a couple of resources that have unintentionally really been breathing this idea into my life. One of them is is a book that our elders are reading together this summer by Alistair Begg. The title of the book is Pray Big. That, that book has been speaking into this, uh, this issue going on in my life, this, this revival in my life. Another one is a book by Bill Eliff that uh, I picked up in, in Prague a couple of weeks ago called The Essential Presence. So all of these things the Lord has providentially put together and has taught me some lessons over the last couple of weeks. And today I want to use 1 John, not 1 John, the Gospel of John chapter 15 to point out some of these things that I've been learning. If you'll turn with me there, I want to read that passage. It's a passage that focuses on this issue of abiding. It is a passage that Uh, happens shortly after what you and I know to be the Last Supper. They've just celebrated the Passover together. Uh, Jesus redefined the cup. He redefined the bread. It's me that you're to focus on, not our forefathers, not their suffering, but my suffering. They get up. They leave the room. They walk down through the Kidron Valley, through a vineyard, and it is in this vineyard that, in, in, in my mental picture, Jesus stops right by a vine a cluster of grapes there. And he turns around and says, boys, I got something I need to tell you. And we get John chapter 15. If you're able, will you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? Starting in verse 1, going through verse 11. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears, does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear 
more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do, say it, nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my, word abide, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Father, we ask today that you would give us new inspiration to be closer to you all the day long. I pray that you would take the words that come out of my mouth and jump on those sound waves and go deep into the heart of your children. I pray this in your holy name. Amen. Jesus is using a physical illustration to point out a critical spiritual truth. Some of these things have just jumped off the page to me in this, these last couple of weeks. I could not, uh, I had to abandon my sermon plan that I've had all planned out this series through 1 John. I had to jump off of that and take this detour because this passage has spoken to me and I have appreciated it. So this week may be more for me than for you. So bear with me as I self-preach. The first thing I want us to remember this week out of this text is that we need to remember who the vine is. It's not me. I'm not the one that causes the growth. I'm not the one that causes the fruit to, to be bared in my own life. I'm not the one that causes fruitfulness, and neither are you. Sometimes we rely on our own charisma, our own abilities, our own uh, talents and skills, and think that that's going to pull it off. We need to remember that we're the branches, we're not the vine. Jesus is teaching us, he's teaching uh, his crew that bearing fruit comes from being connected to him. He is the one that causes fruit. He is the one that causes growth. Being connected to Jesus is not just a part-time thing. That's an important lesson for me. Though I thought I was when I really honed in on the issue of abiding in Christ, I realized I, there were major gaps in this abiding issue. And today, I want, I, again, guilt is not my intent. All I'm asking is that all of us become aware of his presence all day long. Pick up where you are. I'm, I'm gonna challenge you at the end to join me on this journey. I guess I just did. <laughs> to join me on this journey of abiding and recognize how sweet it is. Recognize how sweet your quiet times become, your prayer life. Join me in this. But Jesus quickly turns this object lesson to an uncomfortable place, talking about branches that, that aren't producing, being cut off, Branches that, that are producing, he prunes them. 
can be painful. Taking away the things in our life that hamper us from producing fruit. Here's another lesson that I learned. I must remember that God's plan for my life is not my comfort. Rather, it's for my fruitfulness. That we bear fruit. Uh, You being comfortable. And by the way, simply living in the United States of America is more comfortable than most places around this planet. We like our comfort, don't we? When we were in Europe a couple of weeks ago, I was so hot the entire time and until we got back to our hotel room. These buildings that were from the 11th century and 12th century, you know what they did not have? <laughs> Air conditioning. I'm like, man, why don't they update these buildings or something? I'm not comfortable in here. We like our comfort. But I need to let you know, as a follower of Christ, his main agenda in your life and in my life is not our comfort. It is that you and I bear fruit. Fruit for his kingdom. Fruit that that is lasting. That's his agenda. That's his plan for our life. I don't think there's a one of us sitting in this room that wants to live a fruitless life. We want our lives to matter, don't you? I mean, we want to make a difference in our kids' lives, right? In our grandkids' lives, right? Somebody said great-grandkids a while ago. We want to make a difference. We want to make a difference for the kingdom of God and those people that we work with. Our neighbors. God's main agenda is not our comfort, but for our fruit, to be fruitful followers of Christ. I must remember that the key to a fruitful life is abiding. It's abiding. That's why it's so important that I stop and take a detour and come to this passage that really hones in on this issue of abiding. And that we pick up right where we are No no matter where you are in your spiritual journey, you pick up where you are and begin to be aware of the presence of Christ in your life all day long, especially when you're driving. John Stott, a theologian, his mentor, Eric Nash, was once asked how to grow in holiness and godliness, and his answer was surprising. This is what he said. Just abide, man. Just abide. How true that is. Our relationship with Christ, our connection to the vine, our abiding in him through faith and trust, through our time in God's word and in prayer, all that is the key to fruitfulness. All church and ministry effectiveness is built upon this proposition. It is Christ who gives the increase. And therefore, for for there to be any fruitfulness, we must abide in him. Praying, fasting, quiet times and personal Bible study, devotional life, God's word, are all the are all these are ways to abide and are ways to fruitfulness. Quote from John Stott past couple of weeks have highlighted in my life those gaps during my day. And I was not pleased with that evaluation. One of the reasons I wasn't, it's not the only reason, but one of the reasons I was not pleased with that evaluation is because I stand before you and press in on this issue. Joel, you need to practice what you preach. Joel, you need to abide. And that form of that verb is a constant activity in your life. Abiding. Are you abiding today? Is your life bearing fruit? Fruit that will last? The key to that is 
abiding. The knowledge uh, that, that I've gained over this past couple of weeks doing self-inventory has caused me to be mindful of him during checking emails, when I meet with people in my office, when I take people out to lunch, when I go to lunch by myself, when I'm driving in my car, when I'm sitting in the living room in the evenings with Catherine watching TV, aware of his presence. Because there's just, maybe I'm the only one in the room that in these segments during my day when I'm busy, the presence of Christ did not cross my mind. I don't want that. I don't want that for me and I don't want that for you. And so today I challenge us all to be more aware, be mindful on a consistent basis throughout the day of his presence. You know, thinking about people in the Bible that were aware of God's presence, I think of Moses. Moses, when he, in Exodus chapter 33, verse 16, he says, for how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, speaking to God? I and your people, is it not your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? Bill Eliff commented on this passage in his book, The Essential Presence, that I mentioned earlier. Moses knew more than most ever will that it was the presence and power of God alone that could save him and all those whom he was responsible for. Church, I've been reminded that it is in abiding in Christ, being connected to the vine that will produce fruit in our lives and in our church's lives. Something I want to make sure all of us understand. Not only will abiding in Christ impact your personal life, it impacts the life of this church. Just think about it. If two people in that section, two people in that section, two people in that section were the only ones that were cognizant and, and walking in the presence of Christ day in and day out, that impacts the ministry effectiveness, the fruitfulness of our church. But if all of us, can you, can you see it? So your abiding, my abiding, not only impacts me, it impacts the church. It is important that we all practice the presence of Christ in our life. Verse 5 ties it all together. Verse 5 is our memory verse this week. I want to challenge every one of us in the church to memorize John 15, 5. Look at it with me. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Verse 6. If anyone doesn't abide in me, he's thrown away. Like a branch and withers and, and is thrown into thrown into the fire and burned. Friends, abiding is important. This verse has reminded me how important it is that I guard my relationship. We need to remember to guard our relationship with God. Guard it. Most of the abides, uh, stand with me for just a second. Uh, the word abide is mentioned 10 times in these 11 verses. Most of these are in the subjunctive mood, meaning it's either probable or intentional. Now, if you reread that, that whole passage, you'll see that most of those abides are talking about being intentional. If you abide in me, if you are intentional to abide in me, if you're intentional to keep my word within you and to stay in my word and abide in my word and, and just chew on it like a cow chews on his cud, man, you're taking my word and you're chewing on it all day long. It is then that you'll bear much fruit. Abiding. 
I must remember that the more I abide, the more I will want what Jesus wants. How often do I pray for what I want? How often do you pray for what you want? What would it be like if all of us came to the Lord and said, Lord, you know my heart, you know that I have selfish wants and desires and I'm praying for these people's healings, I'm praying for these things to to happen in my life, but Lord, at the end of the day, I'm gonna stop and say, I want what you want. I want what you want in my life. Yes, I have these desires, but ultimately my desire is what you want. I want it on your time, and I want it in your way. The other form of the verb abide in this passage are imperatives. We see the first one in verse 4. Look at verse 4 with me. This isn't an intentional or probable. This is an imperative. I'm, this is a command. Abide in me. And I in you. The other one we see in verse 9. Look in verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Here it is. Abide in my love. I'm telling you to abide in my love. Church, listen. There ain't another person on the planet that loves that girl right there as much as I do. No one. But my love for her, for Catherine, is a drop in the ocean compared to the love that God has for her. If I had time, I would walk through every row of this room and I would point to every single person, every person, God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. I, I need you to swim in that for a minute because there's some of you sitting in this room and some watching online that probably feel like you are the most unlovable person around because of what you did last night because of what you did this weekend, what you've done earlier in your life, God couldn't love me. And I'm telling you, God loves you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to die on the cross for you, for you, and for you, and for you. Now, I want you to soak that in for a minute. God's love for you. Jesus didn't make a request, he gave a command. Abide in my love. I love you, I love you, I love you. Not I love you if, I love you, period. I love you. I love you. I don't know if you remember how Paul tried to describe God's love in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Listen to this. He says, So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, length, height, and depth, and to know the love of God, of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Can you see, Paul? Guys, I want you to know. I want you to know the, the height. Now listen, hold on. The height, the height of his, the, the, the breath and, and the depth of his. I want you to, oh, forget it. That surpasses knowledge. Paul's trying to get us to know something that's not knowable that you may know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. <laughs> you ever thought about that? He wants, to, uh, wants us to know something that's not knowable. That's how big the love of Christ is for you and you and you and you and you. I want you to swim in it. Today I want you to walk, walk out of here going, man, he loves me more than anything. I tell Catherine all the time, I love you the most. That's not true. God loves you the most. Christ loves you the most. Don't forget it. 
And he says, walk in that. Abide in that. Day in and day out, when those people are saying stuff at school about you and and people at work are talking about you at the water cooler and you don't feel loved, I need you to remember about the love of Christ for you. My mama, when I was a little guy, she would say to me, Joel, I don't care what those girls say about you at school. If they don't like you, you just tell them that your mama loves you. I never said that to any of those girls. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, my mama loves me. No, I never said that, but I still remember it. Guys, I don't care what people say about you at the water cooler at work. If they say mean things about you, which they will as you shine for Christ. You just remember Christ's love for you. My Jesus loves me. I'll move on. Josh Moody, I had to mention this. He describes the love of Christ as the great apologetic. The great apologetic. You may not know a bunch of Bible verses and where they are and and this and that. But when we love the way Christ loves, it is the great apologetic. Because the world doesn't get it. They don't understand it. To love the way Christ loves. Abide in it. And verse 11, look at it with me. It gives us the purpose of all this. I must remember that if I want to experience real joy in my life, I must abide. Look at verse 11. These things I have spoken to you, here's the reason, that my joy may be in you and that you, your joy may be full. Anybody need some joy in your life? Abide in Christ. Abide. I want to encourage you to jump in on this journey with me, that that you would daily take inventory of the gaps. Hey, here's one. Here it is. Those times during your day when temptation comes knocking at the door, when the devil comes knocking at the door of your heart, you simply say, man, I'm a, Jesus, I don't feel like fighting that battle today. Will you answer the door? I want to abide in you. I want to walk with you. I'm not going to give in to that. I'm free from that. Jesus, you set me free from that. And all of a sudden, we begin going to Scripture and, and realizing the things that he has set us free from. I don't want to answer that door. Jesus, will you answer that door today? These are the questions that I want you to ask yourselves this week. And I close with these. What obstacles are keeping me from abiding? What are they? So you take these home this week. I want to ask all of you to do some inventory, self-inventory. What's keeping me from abiding? I'm guessing that most people will write down the word. You know what I'm about to say. What is it? I'm busy. I'm busy. What other obstacles are keeping you from abiding in Christ? The second question, what am I willing to do to take away those things, to overcome those obstacles that are keeping me from abiding? last couple of weeks have been really sweet for me. And I would argue that they'll be the same for you. Because apart from Christ, you and I can't do anything. We can't bear any fruit when we are separated from the vine. Abide in Christ. Deal? Deal? Deal. Let's pray. Father, we come before you.
and we lay our lives before you. In just a moment, we're going to have a few, few moments of silence. And Lord, I would ask you to have the last word in each of our hearts today. Maybe, Lord, you want to point out some obstacles. Maybe it's a hidden sin. Maybe it is busyness. Maybe there are things that need to be pruned from our life that our fruitfulness may increase. So, Lord, take these, take these moments and speak to the hearts of your children, I pray. Father, as we continue to worship in song, pray that the words that we sing will be sung from our heart. That we would mean the words that we're saying, not just reading. And Father, I ask that you would go with each one of us. That you would draw each one of us closer to you. Your word tells us that draw near to you and you will draw near to us. And so if we seek you, we will find you. There are, there's so many places that tell us to, to pursue you. And so, Lord, I pray that each of us would make it a priority in our day, that we would be intentional about abiding in your presence. Lord, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, as we stand and sing, I, I would be glad to pray with you. If you have something in your life that you need prayer over, I'd be glad to do that. Our prayer team will be available as well. But whatever business you need to take care of with God today, let's take care of it. If you've never trusted in Jesus to be your Savior, today's the day. If you have questions about that, I'd love to talk with you. Whatever it is. Let's do it. Do business with Jesus. Let's stand. Sing.